Well, good morning, folks. Good to see you all. I must say you do not look too worse for the wear uh, over, over this weather system this week, although we do have some sick, and Brother Freeman will bring us up to date on that uh, at the appropriate time. I would say uh, some of you, I've not uh, seen these yet, but uh, Nancy posted some photos, I understand, on Facebook this morning. I've got one I want to show tonight, uh, just before I, I get into the lesson in my family talk time. But anyway, go ahead and tell you that uh, Jessica's boy, Jessica and Nick, um, Samson, Andrew, eight pounds and two ounces, and 20 inches long. So uh, baby and mother are fine. That makes three for Jessica, and we're happy for them and happy for Greg and Nancy. I always just take joy in uh, announcing when someone is expecting, and then when there's uh, a birth, and we can rejoice, and especially when everything has gone well, and uh, we don't take that for granted. And so we're, we're thankful for that. And as I say, I've got a, I've got a photo that I will, I'd like to show you tonight, as, I, as my custom is. I've asked Raymond to lead us in prayer to get our study in 1 Samuel underway. So let's bow together as Raymond leads us while we pray. Our Father in heaven, we're, <clears throat> we're thankful for the opportunity to be here again this morning, being able to study from your word. We ask that you be with the teachers and give them an easy remembrance of the things they've prepared and help us as students of yours to constantly try to learn more about you and apply to our lives how to live the way you want us to live. We're thankful, Father, that for the blessings of life that you give to us and our abilities to be out. We know that there are many sick of our number. We ask that you be with them and give them their health back once again as your will be done. Be with us now through this class and our further services this morning. Forgive us for our sins so we can be pure before you during our studies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Raymond. You know, this past Thursday morning, I was just going to test the situation a little bit. Didn't have anywhere I had to go. I can, I can do a lot of uh, uh, work from the house. Um, our power was off, so, but we still weren't suffering too badly. But for the first time, and I don't mean since we've lived in our present house or since we've lived in Hansville, I mean for the first time ever, I could not get out of my driveway. And um, that's, I'm, I'm talking about since I've been driving, which has been 100 years now. Uh, I, I could get to a certain point and then got, they got back in, but uh, that, was, that was just a different feeling. I've never experienced that before. So, and I didn't really like that feeling. I don't like to feel that I couldn't get out in case I wanted to. But anyway, my, my suffering was not, not too bad, but it, it was a bit of, of, of endurance there. Okay, so we're continuing in, uh, in 1 Samuel. And uh, Cheryl has, I've asked her to have the questions ready, which she would have anyway. Um, this will be chapter 13 and 14. What else do you have in your hand? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let's see. Um, we've given out 13 and 14. We've not answered 11 and 12 yet. Am I correct? Am I right about that? So, what I need is uh, to know who needs the present lesson of 11 and 12. And if somebody needs 13 and 14, how are we going to do this? Raise two hands? But let's do this quickly because we've got a lot to cover. I will tell you that Rocky was here early this morning and he has set up a, a new computer. We were having trouble with the other laptop. It was just not working. So thank you, Rocky, for that. So help me out now. Who do I... Um, who do I start with this morning? I think 
All right, so you're saying we need to start with Aaron? Yeah, okay. Okay. And April, I see you made it safely back, and you have your daughter with you. We're glad to have you. Good to see you all. Did you, do you have questions? Do you, do, you need, do you need this sheet? Okay. All right, is that everybody? We're in a state of transition at this point in 1 Samuel. We've been studying the period of the Judges. The period of the Judges began in the book of Judges. And we, what we saw as we continued in our study is that the period, the Bible period of Judges doesn't stop just with the biblical book of Judges. Because we turned to the book of Ruth and we saw in the very first words of Ruth 1 and following that it says, in the days when the Judges ruled. So we learned that book takes place in that period. But then as we covered Ruth and got over into 1 Samuel, we saw that this is still the period of the Judges with Eli serving both as judge as well as um, high priest. And so it is at this point that Samuel is born, and he also was judge over Israel. Though the last, in addition to being a judge, the last verse of 1 Samuel chapter 3 tells us that all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So he functions as a prophet as well as judge. And because he's a Levite, we also see him very much involved in the sacrificial system, especially in this chaotic time after um, Eli's death. We'll see him in that role, but we must remember he's a Levite and not a priest and certainly not the high priest. He's not a priest, period. But he's a prophet and he's a judge and he is a Levite involved in the... uh, worship system and sacrificial system of that day. So in 1 Samuel chapter 8, there's the request that the people made for a king. And we saw that in and of itself, that that form of government is not said to be wrong. But we saw clearly what was wrong in 1 Samuel 8 was their motivation. Who can help me on this? Make us a king So we can be like the nations round about us. Now that's wrong. That's not the right motivation. And they were losing their sense of of identity as the special people of God. They were wanting to be conformed to the world, not just in government, but there was a perpetual problem looking around at the gods of the nations round about them. In that period of the judges, we saw that. We saw that cycle over and over We want to feel for that timeline, don't we? Cheryl, do you think it's important to have a timeline of biblical events? You do that. You teach that, don't you? And so we come on down in time, and and we're able to say that the Exodus took place in 1446, 1447 B.C. Forty years of wandering occur next. And then the conquest takes place about 1406, 1407. It's just within a very short time after that, the period of the Judges starts. And actually from that point to the reign of Solomon, Solomon, I mean, Saul, I mean to say, begins his reign in 1050 B.C. And so you're looking at really about 350 or so years. And, and what I see in the Bible is when Jephthah talked about how long they had had their land, their possession in Israel, he said these 300 years. And the New Testament reference will be made that God gave them judges for 400 years. Those are, those are estimates. Those are round numbers. But at least about 350 years is this period here that we're talking about, the period of the judges. But what we're in right now, as I, as I said when I started that review, what, what we're in right now is a state of transition because where we are now is leaving the time of the judgeship, though Samuel is still living. And he won't die until 1 Samuel chapter 25. That's how long he lives in this book. But he'll ease out of the public role in chapter 12 in particular. We see him doing that. So here's the transition from the period of the judges to the period of the United Kingdom. And so we're just following the the chronology of the Bible, the unfolding of God's plan at this point in, in the history. 
And it's important to, to have that feel for that, to, to know the biblical history like that. And, uh, and it'll just help you as you learn the lessons along. And bear in mind the big picture is God bringing Jesus into the world. But here is how, here's what happened and how he kept uh, that continuity of his plan going, working toward that goal. Okay, uh, Aaron, get us started. First Samuel chapter 11, we're looking at question number one. Who sent for Saul's help? And it was messengers from Jabesh. Rocky, are you back there? One thing I'm finding is with that receiver on the back there, it doesn't seem to be catching this very well. You know what I'm saying? So I bet I could have that um, keypad with me and work from down here, couldn't I? Would that work? Can I advance from that? Hmm? The keypad is? Okay. Well, what am I going to do? Okay, you have any ideas? This is not working. This is not working either. Way to go. You know what I said earlier about thanking you in front of everybody for coming out early this morning and doing this? All I'm saying is there's a lot of good slides I've got and if I can't show you, it's his fault. At least the other one would show the slides if we ever got it going. Okay. Rocky, do you mind if I put this on mute? That's okay. Because I don't trust these people. They're all looking up at the screen to see what you're doing instead of listening. I was just kidding. Sort of. Aaron, um, get us started. Jabesh Gilead. Okay. Which side of the Jordan River is that on? Okay. You sure about that? Yes, that's true. Jabesh Gilead is a is a hint. Gilead, all of Gilead's on the east side. Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead. Number two is next. Number three is next. Yeah, no two were left together. Number four. Wasn't that a good attitude? A lot of kings wouldn't have done that. Sad thing is that later Saul wouldn't have done that. Number five is next. What was done in regard to the kingdom? That it was to be renewed. Where at? In Gilgal. That's correct. Thank you. Um, you, you sometimes you hear the expression of seizing the moment and with Samuel that's what he did um, he seized the moment he said let us renew the kingdom in Gilgal okay are we, are we, are we up to speed now yeah, it, it changed it there you go thank you Rocky I was just kidding about what I said sort of all right, Stan, Gilgal, right here. This is a Gilgal here. You will notice also there's another Gilgal here. Which is it? I'm not certain. Um, I'm not certain. But uh, 
it, it, the place is called Gilgal. Most scholars are going to put it right here for the episode we're looking at right at this time. It's, it's in that area. But my point is, when I, when I said he, he sees the moment, is here is a great victory. God has used their king in a, in, a, in a wonderful way. And so Samuel is saying, okay, let's renew the kingdom at, at Gilgal. And um, he's already king, but the, as I said, that's in a state of transition. It's all new. And so let's, let's renew the kingdom. Let's, and so, uh, so it's, it's a confirmation of Saul as king. And really what you have, what we need to see is that what, what you have in this next chapter takes place at, at this, uh, in, right there at Gilgal, where, where this speech where Samuel has everybody. They've all, you know, if you don't come, your oxen are going to be killed. So they're all there. And so we're going to ignore the chapter division, and we see that uh, Samuel goes ahead and uses this time to address the people of Israel. Chapter 12, question number one. Okay, and the answer to that was what? Okay. Number two, what, how, what testimony did they have to give Samuel? What did they say? Okay. You've not taken anything. You've done us no wrong. You've never taken a bribe. Yes. So, all right. So, but, but he gave the opportunity. If there's anything anyone has against me, this is the time. And no one had anything. Number three is next. Whose turn is it? Number three? Yeah. You do that, it'll be well. That's that's good. Uh, but number four. So having a king won't make any difference if you don't obey the Lord. You see, the real problem, and Samuel knew this, and God knew this, the real problem in this period of the judges was not, well, you know, if we just had a king, we wouldn't be afflicted like this. If we just had a king, um, our enemies wouldn't oppress us like this. Why had God allowed the enemies to oppress them in the time of the judges? It wasn't because they didn't have a king. It was because they weren't obeying. They were going after other gods. So basically Samuel's saying, okay, you asked for a king. God has given you this king. But if you don't obey him, if you don't obey God, then both you and your king will be swept away. It won't do you any good. See, the, the thing is, a lot of times people are like that. It, there's a problem. There's a problem. And that what they try to address is something superficial or something that is a tangent to the issue. And they don't address the core issue. And they think they're going to solve it by putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Israel wouldn't solve their problem during, that, that they had uh, had during the period of the judges by having a new form of government, by having a king. And that's what Samuel is saying. If, now, if you serve the Lord, he'll bless you. It'll go well. But if you don't, having a king won't make any difference. That's really what he's saying. Greg? Yeah, that's true. And he mentions that. And it's mentioned in chapter 8 as well. What did, um, what did God need to remind Samuel of in chapter 8 when the people asked for a king? Anybody remember that? All right, good. Verse Samuel 8, they, and verse 6, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. See, there, and there's a good lesson there too. A lot of times we take things personally. You invite someone to attend services and, and he's, he's kind of miffed, you know, mind your own business. You encourage somebody to study the Bible and you, you go about it as nicely as you can. I mean, if we're not, 
we, we can go about it in such a way that uh, is not inviting. We can be abrasive with people and turn people off. But I'm saying you can go about it in a Christ-like way and people re reject that. And so it's like, well, that hurts my feelings. That really makes, and we should feel badly if people reject truth and opportunities to study the truth. But we should understand if someone rejects the gospel, they have not rejected me. They've not rejected you. They've rejected the Lord. So bear that in mind. Samuel needed to be told that. We need to be told that. All right, we've got one more question on chapter 12, and that's number 5. So the two things, he's going to pray and he's going to teach. And that concludes our questions, but let me ask you this. What did we, what did we start out by saying that Samuel was? Samuel was a what? He's a judge and a prophet. Who can define what a prophet is? Yes. How, how does he speak for God? What, what is that process called? Inspiration. It's inspiration. Is God directly giving him the message and he's only to say what God gives him? Is, is that the process? Well, if that's true, if God is just giving it, to, I mean, did, did Samuel have to, uh, is it a case where he had to think and think and think and study? Or did God reveal it to him? Well, if that's the case, God is just revealing it to him, then he doesn't have to pray. Right? No, that's not right. Turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Now, you, re you may remember, you, re you may remember that the apostles had been told that the Spirit would reveal to them all truth. And that when they were arrested, the, the point is specifically made that if they're arrested and they have to get their, their own trial, uh, then this is uh, Matthew 10 and other passages like this. But the point is specifically made, don't take any thought beforehand, for it will be given you in that hour what you shall say. For it is not you that speaks, but the Spirit, Holy Spirit that speaks in you. So here are men that are apostles. They're being revealed all truth, and if they're called on the carpet, they don't prepare their thoughts ahead of time. The Spirit will instruct them what to say. But when they select these seven men, and when I say they, the church in Jerusalem, the disciples select the seven men whom the apostles would appoint over this business. The church did the selecting. The apostles did the appointing. But they... They say that they're going to do this. They, they outline this plan to, to the brethren in verse 3 of Acts 6. And then the apostles in verse 4. Greg, what do they, Greg Paconia, what do they say? See, I, I need to remind myself of that passage. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. See, if, if I'm not careful, how do I f define the work of the apostles? Well, the Spirit inspired them. They spoke the Word. They wrote the Word. It's given orally. It's put in written form. And they confirmed the Word by the miracles they did. They traveled. They preached the Gospel. They were to preach the Gospel to every creature. That's their work, right? Yes, but we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The apostles, the apostles were putting out a lot. Their resources were flowing out to meet the needs of people. But the inner man has to be renewed day by day. If it's not being renewed and there's only an outflow, you'll burn out. You won't have anything to give. 
And so, I mean, that, that's true of the apostles, and it sure is true for us. But I'm just interested in noticing, and I know, I know that it, it, the point would be, you, you could say, well, yeah, but Samuel's talking about praying for the people. Uh, and, I, and I would grant that. But, but these men of God are men of prayer. And, and the, the, the prophets were men of prayer. Moses was a man of prayer, a great intercessor. And I'm, I'm just wanting to, to kind of highlight what he's saying, that I'm going to pr pray for you, and I'm going to teach you. And he's saying it would be wrong for me to neglect either one of these. And I, and I see that with the apostles in Acts 6 and verse 4. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So even though we might say, well, uh, the, the matter of truth was revelation to them, uh, you know, do you know that they still read and they still studied? Do you know how I know that? In 2 Timothy 4, when Paul's execution was imminent, and he wrote Timothy, besides asking that he would bring him the cloak that he left at Troas, he also said, bring the, bring the books, especially the parchments. So, perhaps books of Scripture, I don't know, but the books especially the parchments. You know the difference in books and parchments? Books were written on papyrus, made from the papyrus plant, the forerunner of our paper. Parchment is made from animal skins. But that's neither here nor there, except that's what he's talking about. So, that's uh, 1 Samuel 11 and 12, our questions, and some application maybe of some of that. You have your question sheet on 13 and 14, and just this morning, I've run off 15 and 16 to give to you at the end of class. Did somebody say something? Anybody? Did somebody want to say something? Well, let's, uh, let's turn back. At least for me, it's turning back to 1 Samuel chapter 13. You've got a little bit of a... Uh, uh, a, a textual glitch in the first verse um, that uh, apparently where, what, what I've read about the textual issue is sometimes a letter can, can drop out in the matter of copying it and many scholars believe that is what uh, happened here. But in, in 1 Samuel chapter 13 the New King James reads Samuel reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel and, and so then it continues. Um, but as I say, if, depending on your translation, you may, you may see something different. Uh, Brother Pender, what are you reading out of this morning? Okay, that's what I have. Now, the New International Version. Uh, Donna, are you there with me in chapter 13, verse 1? Can you read that good and loud for me? No, you don't. You're reading. Okay. So, what do you have here? Well, it, it's um, the New International. I don't know if you could hear Donna or not, but uh, she doesn't have a microphone, of course, and I do, and that helps for you to hear me if I have the mic. But I want, to, I want to reiterate what she just read. The text reads, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Is that correct, Donna? All right, so he reigned over Israel 42 years. Now, that part, uh, here again, it is, um, it is a case of looking at, at a textual issue that I want, don't want to get bogged down on, what, what, what I can say is that we are on safe ground if we want to know the total time that Saul reigned. We know that Saul reigned for 40 years. Uh, the New Testament, uh, the New Testament uh, makes that point. And um, Acts 13, I just want to give you the passage. Uh, so, and, and then I'm going to say this and we'll go on. But Acts 13 and verse 21, Paul is preaching at Antioch of Pisidia. 
Later, this is going to be one of the churches of Galatia, but here's where he was first preaching, you know, before there was a church there. In Acts 13 and verse 21, Aaron, would you like to read that for me? Okay, so there's not a textual problem here in Acts 13. Paul is preaching, and he's speaking by inspiration, and so Paul says Saul reigned for 40 years. So how do you let Scripture interpret Scripture? Well, you, maybe if you, have, if you have a passage where, like in this text of 1 Samuel, where, where there might have been in the, in the process of scribes copying this, a letter dropped out like many do that, believes impacts what, uh, why you'll find a variant reading like I've just shown you. But, well, how, how can we know? How long did he reign? Well, here's a passage in the New Testament, and it clears that up. So that's, that's all we need. Uh, but, but what you might want to do in 1 Samuel 13, in your margin there by verse 1, you might just want to write Acts 13, verse 21. Acts 13, 21. Because that nails down in the New Testament record that the total number of years that he reigned, Saul reigned, were 40 years. Now it turns out to be an interesting thing and I guess it's because if something is easy to remember, I mean, why not just be thankful for that? Because some things are a little harder to remember. But it turns out that Saul and David and Solomon all reigned for 40 years. How easy is that? So that's how long Saul reigned, it's how long David reigned, and it's how long Solomon reigned. Now after that, you're on your own. Actually, you're not. But after that, it's harder to keep up with because the reigns are going to vary a whole lot. I mean, you've got, you're going to have Zimri who reigned a total of seven days. You've got kings that will just reign a month or three months. And so you're going to... Uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of assassinations like 2 Kings uh, 15. I think you've got just a real turnover there uh, in Israel. Uh, three or four or five kings mentioned just in one chapter, just really going through them. So it, it can get kind of complex, but we're at the simple part now. He reigned for 40 years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the one in Acts. Yeah, that was Acts 13, verse 21, wasn't it? I've closed my... New Testament. What was that correct? Acts 13, verse 21. So what I found handy over the years, uh, as I say, just write in your margin. It doesn't take much room, but in 1 Samuel 13, 1, if you just jot that in your margin, or you can make a note electronically. A lot of you are using electronic Bibles, and, and you're allowed, you know, you know how that works. You can make notes in that too, so that works just fine. Okay, enough on that. So Saul has when it says he chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel, 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah. And it, the rest of the people he sent away every man to his tent. And what this probably means is that before we're talking about an actual battle, it's talking about the difference between a standing army as opposed to the total number of soldiers. Now we saw, do you remember uh, uh, last time when, when uh, he gathered all of Israel and they attacked Jabesh Gilead that there were 300,000 the soldiers from Israel, and what, what does it say? Was it 30,000 from Judah? Something like that. So, you know, you got over 300,000 when he gathered everybody fighting uh, against the Ammonites. But here he's sending everyone away except for 3,000. He keeps two, and 1,000 is with Jonathan. And yet, what we see is that when it goes ahead to describe the battle that's going to come up, he doesn't have those hundreds of thousands. It's, in other words, he the people are so scared he ends up having about 600 men, you know, as the time, as it goes on, but we'll, we'll see that. Now it says 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash. Let me see. I need to get where we can see uh, Michmash here. Okay. 
so a thousand are with uh, with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. Now I've shown you a photograph of Gibeah, I guess two or three times. That's that's actually Saul's home, and uh, that's just just barely north of, of Jerusalem, a little bit a little bit to the east as well as north. And so what you have now, there's another place mentioned in verse three. That is, there's a garrison of the Philistines in, in Geba. And Jonathan attacked them. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Stanley, this Gilgal keeps being mentioned, and here it is again. So here, here they are gathering at Gilgal, and so uh, you see one thing leads to another. Saul, uh, Jonathan, I mean, uh, Saul's son, attacks these Philistines at Geba. That's in Benjamin too. Benjamin also. And so now the Philistines are very angry. It says Israel had become a, an abomination to them. And so now they're gathered together to fight with Israel. And uh, so we, we have, the, they have the chariots, they have the horsemen, people as sand of the sea, and they came together and encamped at Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. And so the men of Israel saw they were in danger, they were distressed, and so what did they do in verse 6? What did the people start doing? Yeah. And not only that, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Aaron, as I was mentioning a while ago, east of the Jordan and the central part is Gilead. And so um, they're, just, they're just leaving the western side altogether. You know, where, where we are when we talk about Michmash, uh, I, will, I will show you that probably just in a little bit. Uh, but where we are at Michmash is, is still a little further to the east. And the thing about that, I used to read that really up, up until recently. I just didn't have a good picture of that in my mind. Because I'm thinking Philistines, Philistines, and Michmash. I, I, didn't, I wasn't clear on where that was. But it's well east of Jerusalem. It's out, it's out desert. In other words, let me put it this way. You can stand on a high point of uh, elevation at Michmash, and you can look over and you can see the Transjordan that they fled to. You can look down and see the Dead Sea. And, and I just didn't realize that the Philistines were way out of their ter territory, which is on the coast. And not only are they, you know, way up in the hill country, they've even gone beyond the hill country of Judea. They're on the other side of the hill country uh, approaching the Jordan Valley. And like I showed you a while ago, that's where that Gilgal is, you know, down in the Jordan Valley. And so some of the people just, they, they cross the Jordan, they're running away. So it's really a bad time. Uh, Israel is, is very demoralized at this point in time. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's not anything even left over there except, like I say, the Badlands. All that's the, you know, except for a few oases, it's all desert. There's nothing left. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's uh, as verse 7 continues. It says that the Saul was in Gilgal, all the people followed him trembling. And so he's waiting for seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel didn't come. Now, that's qualified. Again, every passage, Brady, every passage has a, has a context. That's correct. So when it says he didn't come to Gilgal, you, you keep on reading. Well, he did come. In fact, he got there that day. But the point is he didn't get there as early on that day at the time Saul wanted him to and thought that he would. But he's still there that day, it, it turns out. But Saul is like, he can't wait anymore. The people are scattering. He says, bring here a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. So he offered, he offered the burnt offering. Yeah. Yes. When, uh, when Gideon was encamped against the Midianites, it was 42 to 1. What is it? 450 to 1? 450 to 1. But when it's 300 versus 135,000. 
Yes. And here you go. They got an army and they're running like yeah. scared, scared cats. That's true. And the Lord was with Gideon. And so they, they, they And he had promised to be with them. They continue to have a lack of faith. That's that's the that's the point. But what happens is, verse 10 is where I was leading up to. It says, as soon as he, that means Saul, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, guess who came? Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And, and the word greet there, by the way, means bless. And so, thank you, Rocky, I appreciate that. You know, I've, I've done a little teasing, but Rocky is really working hard to make this work. He's wanting it to work right, and, and he's going to keep on till it is right. It's, uh, it's just, we talked about the transition from the judges to the king. Well, we're, we're trying to make a transition that'll be workable. So you, you all know I've, I was teasing earlier, and I know he knows that. So, uh, but as I say, uh, uh, Saul is like, boy, you know, great to see you. And he, he's going there to greet him. And I'm glad you're here. And uh, maybe even a blessed in the name of the Lord. Shalom. Samuel said, what in the world? What have you done? Samuel said in verse 13, you've done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. What does it mean to tell a king that your kingdom shall not continue? I mean, does that mean he's out of business right now? He has to leave the throne? What does it mean to say your kingdom shall not continue? Yeah, yeah your, your, your dynasty will not continue. It, you're not going to have sons after you that will reign and your kingdom can you know, continue in that sense. So that's, uh, he's telling him right off, you know, the, it, it won't continue. It would have, but it won't. And then he goes on to say, without calling the name yet, the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Who is this man after God's own heart? It's David. The thing is, even Samuel doesn't know who it is yet. Did you know that? Samuel won't know who it is to chapter 16 when Saul reveals it. He just knows now God has selected someone else. So Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And so Saul numbered the people with him. See, we started out with this reference to 2,000 at the start of the chapter. And that, this is what I was anticipating now. It says 600 men. And so uh, Saul... Uh, jo uh, Jonathan, his son, and the people with him remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, Gibeah, that's Saul's home city. But the Philistines encamped, encamped in Michmash. So, let's, uh, here is Gibeah. This is an aerial shot. And it's going to mention, let, well, let me just tell you why we got this up here, that raiders came, verse 17, out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned on the road to Orpha, to the land of Shaul, or Shual, I should say. Another turned to the road of Beit Horan. And while we've got, got this here, and again, to give you some reference, you're looking across, see over here? That's across the Jordan, see that? Now Gibeah, where, Saul, where it says Saul and Jonathan were, that's right over here. But when it talks about some of the raiders going through, now these are not armies uh, destroying everybody. Raiders are going through, they're, they're taking what they want. There's a difference, you know, in, in a battle where you're killing everybody and raiders that are, you know, confiscating everything. But when it talks about they're going down to the way of Beit Horan, this is the area that, that they're, they're making their way going down in this area. Uh, and by the way, later on it's going to talk about Aijalon, Aijalon, uh, after the battle in chapter 14. So you can, all, you can see a lot of what's in our study right there. And here, here, here again, a better shot focusing on the way of Beit Horon Upper, Beit Horon, we're going to the south and east, uh, I should say south and west, and that's lower Beit Horon. And what they're doing is that that's, they're going, as I say, in that, in that direction, on the, in these raiding parties. And another, it says, turn to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now here we're looking the opposite direction. And this is Transjordan over here, see? But this is the valley of Zeboim, uh, toward the wilderness. So this is the area where they were going through with their raids as well. 
Now verse 19 says, and, and this is something we don't know till now, you know, where we're wondering, why is everybody running and why are they afraid? But we learn now what's going on in verse 19. There were no blacksmiths to be th found throughout all the land of Israel. The Philistines, you see, had a monopoly on iron production and, and, uh, and blacksmithing. They had a monopoly on that. By the way, archaeologists call this point in time the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. But in Israel, they don't have access to that. Iron is being used by other civilizations. But right now, the, the, the Philistines are, have the upper hand in that. They say, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. In fact, if I were to skip ahead to verse 22, that on that day of battle, what does verse 22 say about their weapons? Who's reading with me? Edna, read it for me. What does it say? All right, so here's all these Philistines. They've got their chariots. Here's all these foot soldiers. They've got their swords. They've got their spears. And all the army of Israel, Jonathan and Saul are the only one that have a sword or spear. So the Israelites, they had, what, what, if, what if they wanted to sharpen their tools? Well, they had to go to the Philistines, verse 20, to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattocks, his axe, and his sickle. Now I'm reading from the New King James. Are you reading with me? Verse 21 tells how much the Philistines charged. And it says, the charge for sharpening was a peam for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes to set the points of the goats, a peam. Now, you may have a translation that differs from that. But it's talking about the price for sharpening. What does yours say, Jonathan? So it's giving what the amount was in terms of currency, not coinage. But this is a weight. Now, I know you'll want to know this. This is a uh, hopox legomenon. What that means, Greg, is that this word is only found one time in the scripture, and it's right here, peem. So do you, want to, you want to know what that is. Now, you, you might could tell I really wanted to be able to show you some things this morning. Well, the maps and photos are good, but I, this, this peem, um, th these are three weights that were used by the Israelites. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but in, in Hebrew right here, that is actually inscribed peem. Those are letters right there, peem. And what, what, the, what the New King James did was to just transliterate. It took the Hebrew letters and just put that into our English. So it comes out peem. Well, what does that mean? Well, to us it doesn't mean anything. But what it meant was it was a weight. And so you have different amount, different weights, and it's the one right here in the middle that's saying when, when you came, this is the weight that would be on one side of the scale, and you would put that shekel, that, what does it say, two-thirds of a shekel? Or a third, what does it say? Two-thirds on the other side, that's how much you would, you would pay. And so, and yeah, here it is, two-thirds of a shekel, the New English translation says. And so here, here is the way that would work. This would be the scale with the weight. This is where you would put the raw silver. The reason you did that, you may, do I have any money? I mean, you may think in terms of paying like this. Coinage was not invented at this point in history. And so this is the way you would make a transaction. The weight, the peem. Now, I've, I've photographed these at the Israel Museum. This was from the Semitic Museum in Harvard where I took this photograph, and this one right here is the peem over here. So uh, this, this, again, is uh, uh, how, that would, how that would work. So uh, that's, that's just the situation that Israel was in at this time. I mean, they had their farm tools but they didn't have weapons. But if they wanted to get their tools sharpened, they couldn't sharpen them. They would have to go to the Philistines to sharpen them, and they, they would pay in shekels, two-thirds of a shekel, uh, for their sharpening. Uh, Brother Pender? Well, I just wondered, at one point, they, they couldn't turn those, those shekels and put them in the, the army, like swords, like that. It, it would prevent that, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, the, just everything you did in terms of shaping, forging, you know, uh, sharpening, uh, uh, remaking something out of the materials, you can't do that without the blacksmith. And so the, they, the Philistines had a monopoly on that. But I will tell you that um, even though I know that things like this are not the most important things in the world, it gives me great joy to be able to read a passage like that that has difficulties and challenges and to understand myself and to show you this is what it means. That's what that's saying. And so that, that's how that worked out. And so the important part is and how that fits in is here's the situation. That's what they were having to do just to get tool sharpened. And this is why they were at such a disadvantage and people are hiding in caves. They're running to the other side of the Jordan. They're just getting out of there. When you get to this battle that took place that is in uh, the next chapter at, at Micmash. So we got to quit for now.